everyone. Hi. You're in for a treat right now. We are, uh, our next speaker has an amazing YouTube channel. It's called Mike's Electric Stuff. He does teardowns of expensive equipment and not so expensive equipment and analysis of other types of electronics. He's done a lot of public art installations or LED design for public art installations. And he's going to be talking about LED, all the things he's learned working with LEDs. So please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Mike Harrison. Hi folks. Um, yeah, what I'm going to be talking about is what I've basically done in my day job um, last sort of 10 years or so. Um, generally large scale LED installations, um, architectural stuff, um, art, retail spaces, that sort of thing. There's just a few random selections here. Um, these are some RGBW lead rings. These are about sort of that, that diameter, all made out of PCB. Um, these are some custom lead boards, which were these were mounted on the end of some acrylic tubes to provide some uh, basically single pixel vertical tube installations. Um, these are some custom um, lead assemblies that went into some big sort of square boxes to, to provide large fixtures. I've actually done a YouTube video on, on the design of these. Um, this is just a very large wall. These were like a Pac-Man shaped PCB that fits together. This is actually in a uh, hospital in Norway. There's a couple of interactive sensors in there. These are, again, uh, these are RGBW. Um, this is in, uh, in um, I think it's, Van it's in Vancouver or Toronto, I can't remember, somewhere in Canada. These are big sort of obelisk shaped things with light sensors and LED. So people walk past one side and you, you can see a shadow on the other one. Um, this was quite a few years ago. As far as I know, this is still working. I haven't had any feedback recently. Um, <laughs> uh, this is part of an installation we did in Hong Kong. These are all made out of PCBs. There is a talk I gave on this. I think it's, um, I gave a talk at EMF Campbell, I think it was, and it's on my YouTube playlist somewhere about the design of this. Um, this is London Heathrow Airport Terminal 2, uh, about 350,000 LEDs. Um, if they'd have let us, it would pull 25 kilowatts if you turn them all on, but they'd only give us 5 kilowatts, so we can't turn them all on at once. <laughs> but again, I've done a YouTube video about the design of all this stuff, so if you're interested, you can sort of find, find out about it. The nice thing about doing this sort of work is the only things my customers care about is that it works. They don't care about all the design IP and stuff, so I can talk about the detailed design side of things. So just to give the, this is all the, the context of, you know, um, a lot of the stuff I do, and... One of the keys for what I'm going to be talking about later is that you know, we're not producing conference badges. We want subtle, smooth, beautiful looking things. We're not trying to create disco effects or flashy things. It's going to be, you know, it's to accentuate the environment. It's to make it look nice and smooth and nice sort of smooth fades and not horrible pixely things and jerky frame rates, which I find really annoying. Um, uh, there's a few just very brief things I've learned. You know, you want to keep things as simple as possible. You've got these large scale things. You want to, you know, to have it modularize it so each module is simple so that if you get one thing that works then the rest is just going to work because it's just more of the same thing and just really silly things like if you've got IDs in a some sort of say lead node is at some point let's say three years hence someone might want to replace it now they're not going to want to find the weird bit of software used to program the node yeah the node address they just want to set a dip switch and go just replace like for like so there's a lot of details like that which are uh, on the face, it seemed fairly simple, but actually are very, very important fundamentally in terms of producing a system. You know, it's a custom system. Yeah, there, there usually is some documentation, but 
quite often this is maintained, it may be on the other side of the world, so we need to maintain it with local staff. So we give them a manual that says, if this board dies, you know, take a board out of the spares kit, set the switch the same, swap them over, done, job done. Um, that, that's actually very important. Um, long lifetime. Um, because these are generally one-off installations, you don't really have much time to do extensive testing and whatever, so you want to just try and avoid as many potential problems as you can. I mean, I generally scare the crap out of my clients by explaining all the things that could go wrong. Uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, the flip side of it, yeah, and this is how we mitigate it. So, for example, you know, you do not run your LEDs at their data sheet rating because, you know, you want them to last a long time. So always, you know, underrate everything. No, no one ever got fired by underrating things and making them uh, run cool because heat is the big, the, the big thing you want to avoid. Similarly, power supplies, you do not want power supplies with fans in them because, you know, they will get blocked up. They will die eventually. Um, if anyone's after these particular recommendations, I really like the Meanwell HLG series, which are like potted in a aluminium extrusion. They're you know, completely sealed, no fans, and the, the, they were great. And again, as I mentioned before, ease of installation. Quite often, you're on a difficult work site. It costs. You might, for example, have to be working overnight um, with expensive equipment like access equipment. So you want everything just to plug together and work. No, you know, messing about, programming things on site or anything. Just get in there, get it installed. Uh, all plugged together, and even if you have to, have to spend you know, quite a lot of money on like extra connectors so that you can pre-assemble things, go to, go to site, plug it together, rather than doing. But you know, you don't want to be wiring stuff up with individual wires. You want to go in, plug it in, and, and go. Yeah, anything you spend on good quality connectors is easily going to be saved. If you can get, say, a four-night install down to three nights, then you've paid for you know five hundred pounds worth of connectors easily. Excuse me, my voice. I, I'm hoping my voice is going to last. I've had a bad throat all week, so we'll see how it goes. Um, most of my stuff tends to be monochrome because, again, we're often going for subtle, you know, accenting architectures. We're not trying to be sort of disco-y. Where we do have colour, it generally tends to be RGBW. Um, a number of reasons, but mostly, yeah, RGB is... Yeah, it's good for doing really brash, bright colours, but that's generally not what we want. What we want is nice, subtle things, pastels, tints, and so on. And for that, you pretty much need to use RGB plus a, plus a white lead. Um, it has other advantages. Um, and anyone that's seen certainly lower-cost video walls trying to do white, they always look terrible because you've got three colours. So in each of those RGB leads, you've got variation in both the intensity and sometimes the actual centre colour itself. So... Yeah, it's very, very hard to do um, a good white using RGB. Some of the more expensive video walls where they've actually individually calibrated them can do it, but generally it looks awful. It's much easier to do it using uh, RGBW. But also, if you care about power, for example, if you're doing battery-powered um, stuff, um, white using a white LED will typically be a half to a third of the amount of power. So, yeah, again, that's always a good thing. Run things cool. And so if you're worried about, for example, if you're doing like a wearable or something like that, it makes a huge difference. Um, obviously, a lot of the times you're creating um, stuff from RGB source material. And there's a fairly easy way of getting pretty close um, to sort of convert that RGB to RGBW. You just take, you know, that, this represents one particular colour we want this section of it is effectively the whiteness. So we just take all that, chop it off of everything, and stick it on the white. Obviously, there's going to be some scaling factor sometime, but if you've got RGB source material, this is a pretty simple way of turning that into RGBW to get the, particularly the power advantages. But also, um, if you're going for like more subtle pastels, you might have to maybe play around with the scaling factors to um, and use perhaps more complex colour models, but that's something that generally my it's, that this is the sort of thing where it's usually my client's problem to do that. Yeah, my responsibility generally ends at the USB port. Yeah, they give me the content, I display it. Um, so yeah, there are there are I'm sure there's much more sophisticated ways of doing that, but for a first approximation that works quite nicely. Um, so there's a few other th uh, there's a sort of few blanks just to tell me where the pauses are because there's a few other subjects which are related in some way but it's a, it's like really a, a random list of the things that I didn't really know when I started doing this sort of stuff like 12 years ago and learned in the process um, 
particularly with monochrome, your eyes are not linear. If you take a big string of, say, white LEDs and light them up from zero to 100%, either in, either in space or in time, like, for example, you're doing a fade from off to white to white to off, or you're trying to do a gradient on, on there, if you go from not to 100% of power, that bottom is what you're going to see. So you can see, like, dark, 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 then it's light for almost all of that, that range. So what you need to do is apply some correction, usually called gamma correction, um, to effectively compensate for that. Now, you can go into a lot of maths and so on, but in practice, if you just take your 0 to 100% intensity, square that, and then display that, that gets you close enough for most purposes. So, for example, typically you'd have an 8-bit value um, from 0 to 255, from black, black to white. Take that value, square it, and then take however many of the top bits you've got in your display hardware to actually represent the intensity, and that will give you quite a nice um, grayscale. And this then leads on to the second issue, is once you realise you need to do this correction, you then realise that eight bits of intensity generally isn't enough. Um, this is actually showing six bits, just to emphasise the differences. But obviously, yeah, this red line is the curve that you want to display. And if you've only got limited bits, what happens here is you get a really, really nasty step. So instead of going smoothly from black all the way up to white, you see very visible steps, again, either in space or in time on that. So you generally need more than eight bits. So the question is, how many do you actually need? Um, ideally, 12. Above 12, you're not really going to see any difference. Um, but 12 is a, a very nice um, sort of happy medium between complexity and looking nice. Even for like a very, very slow fade, 12 bits is pretty much going to do it for you. Um, Colour is a little bit different because if you, for example, you've got RGB, you've effectively got 24 bits, um, 8 bits per cut. If you're going for 8 bit um, resolution, you've got a total of 24 bits, but only if you're using all, the, all those three. If you want to do like a nice smooth fade from black to green, you're still going to have the same issue. You're, you're still going to see that steppiness at the bottom end. Um, so, yeah, colour is less obvious because usually you've got a mix of the, those LEDs and they actually effectively increase your resolution, but yeah, you can get nasty surprises if you just happen to want to do a, a primary colour and so on. Um, when you're doing this correction, a good place to do it is actually in the actual, yeah, as late as possible, because generally you've got some system where you're throwing data around the place via DMX or whatever transport, and then you're going into some sort of lead fixture that's taking that DMX and actually displaying it. If you do this correction in that fixture, firstly, you can make any compensation for any specific characteristics of that fixture, but also it means that you're only throwing around 8 bits per pixel rather than 16 bits. And there, so, for example, most of the, the most common uh, data format in this area is DMX, which is one byte per um, channel. You can do 16-bit over DMX, but um, it just makes life a lot easier. And if you apply it before the correction, 8 bits is enough in almost all cases. Um, so you've got your two, 256 real grey levels, which are, are, are corrected. Um, that 256, even if you're doing a very slow fade, you really aren't going to see any steppiness. Um, and that, yeah, that, that works. Yeah, again, that, that's what I pretty much always do in the custom led stuff I do. And yeah, it, always, it, it works really nicely. Um, this is just an illustration of the number of bits of hardware um, versus what it looks like. Unfortunately, the slightly unfortunate color choice, but the yellow is the 12 bit. And that's the point where this is the, only the bottom 16th end of the, um, the, the grayscale. But as you can see, as you go from the red line, which is 10 bits to the, to the um, yellow of uh, 12, Anything more than that is diminishing returns. So, yeah, 12 is a nice sort of sweet spot on there. So, as to actually dimming the lead, now obviously there's two ways you can do it. You can adjust the lead current or you can switch it on and off really quickly. Um, sometimes it's tempting to think that, you know, dimming the change in the lead current is a good idea, but generally that isn't done. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. One is that using some sort of modulation, typically pulse width modulation is a lot easier and cheaper, but also most LEDs are, their intensity is bin. So for example, if you buy a reel of surface mount LEDs, they will be guaranteed to be within a certain percentage intensity of each other and also color. Um, and that is done at a specific color, which is usually listed in the data sheet. If you run your LEDs a long way less than that, you can quite often find that the, the brightness variation is quite noticeable particularly because white LEDs are so efficient. You can run a, LED at 100, a white LED at 100 microamps, but if you like, have a big, big array of those, 
leads which are specced at 20 milliamps running at 100 microamps, you will often see a, a very big difference in the intensity from those, between those leads. So it's better to actually run those leads at 10 or 20 milliamps, but for a very short period of time. If, you, if uniformity of the, you know, from lead to lead is important, yeah, in some cases it doesn't matter, but if you've got like a large array of them, any non-uniformity becomes you know, quite noticeable quite quickly. Um, and another reason, say, li linear dimming is gen just generally more complicated because you're dealing with analog um, currents and so on. So it's, it, there are rarely a good reason to use linear dimming. Um, but quite often, if you're using a, there's a lot of like standard 16-channel LED drivers for sort of small LEDs, they will often have some sort of current control. And that can actually sometimes, let's say, for example, you've got a 12-bit con PWM control on your uh, lead driver I see, you may also have a, cu um, a current control, and that can sometimes be useful just for providing things like global brightness control within a certain range. Typically, it's only within maybe perhaps a four to one range, so it's probably not going down to the level at which you're going you're to see non-uniformity, so it just gives you a bit of extra control on that. But uh, generally, you know, changing the lead current towards the brightness is generally not a good idea. There are some cases where it, it is useful, but for the most part, it's not a particularly useful uh, technique. So normally the way we do it, I'm sure anyone that's played with LEDs will have come across this pulse width modulation. You turn the LED on and off for different amounts of time. The longer it's turned on, the brighter it is. Um, but there's, there's a few sort of quite subtle details involved in this. Obviously, um, there's a lot of hardware support, a lot of micros have PWM, a lot of LED drivers. Yeah, there's quite a few 12 and 16 channel drivers that have got built in PWM. But you have to do a little bit of thinking, for example, what frequency do you want your LEDs to be turning on and off at? If it's too low, then you get visual flicker. I'm sure anyone that's done any work outside in the soldering area, because the, those LEDs are a little bit flickery, they'll notice when you move your soldering on, you get like dotted things going on. Um, but also, flicker is particularly notable in peripheral vision. It's one of these things that affects different people to different extents. But if you're walking past something and you're doing PWM, say, down at 100 hertz, you may well notice some visual flicker, if not directly, as it goes through your peripheral vision. Because obviously, it, um, through sort of evolution, the eye senses its emotion in the peripheral. Because it's, you know, if your, your woolly mammoth is about to attack you, you know, you're quite sensitive to that. So. That's why you, know, you need to have it high enough to get to not have visual, visual flicker. But also, if you have it too high, particularly as you get into the audible range, you can get some nasty artifacts, which again may or may not matter depending on the environment. If it's a quiet, quiet environment, you don't really want your lead fixtures making audible squeaks. And there's a number of reasons that this can happen. If you've got any ceramic capacitors there, they can be quite microphonic and, you know, and reverse as the current, the current changes through them. They can emit audible sounds. Uh, power supplies, again, can quite often make nasty squeaky sounds. And sometimes I've actually had LEDs themselves that produce audible noise when you turn them on and off within the audio frequency. I've no idea what the mechanism is, but I have had it happen. It's not common, but it does happen. Um, also, if you go too fast, then you can run into issues of how quickly you actually turn that lead on and off, depending on what you're actually using. For example, using, say, a little MOSFET to turn the uh, lead on and off. As you, as you get down to, like, microseconds or below, what can happen is that you've got, say, a finite delay in that turn-on, so that at the bottom end, your pulse width modulation becomes non-linear because your on and off times get asymmetrical. It's not, it's not generally a huge issue, but it can happen. As I said, 250 hertz is generally where I tend to end up outside, you know, unless there's any, any other constraints. 250 is, you know, seems to work pretty well in pretty much all circumstances. It's low enough not to be very audible, but it's high enough not to reduce much flicker. Um, one other thing that you need to bear in mind, again, this is something I tend to ask fairly early on with my clients is, do they, you know, how important is it that this thing looks good if they video it? Um, because depending on things like the shutter time on the camera and so on, even at 250 hertz, if it's a, something bright, some cameras will shut down, close down their exposure time um, on a bright scene, and that can cause flickering issues. So that, that's something which, yeah, it's one of those non-obvious questions. You produce amazing LED installation, then the client says, oh, hang on a minute, we tried to film this and it looks rubbish, by which time you're, you're a bit screwed. So that's, that's quite an important um, uh, factor. So let's look at some of the details of this um, in practice. So 250 hertz, which is four milliseconds per on-off cycle. Now, we've already seen that we ideally want 12 bits, so we want 4,096 
intensity levels because after we've done the correction, we need that to get there nice, smooth grayscales. So that means we need roughly um, one microsecond timing resolution. Now, if you've got a microcontroller with hardware PWM, that's fine. That'll do that easily. There's plenty of multi-channel drivers that do PWM, and again, that's that that that's generally fine. Um, but if you need to then do, say, let's say you're using a really low end micro, it becomes difficult. One channel you can generally do with, say, a couple of timer interrupts, but as soon as you have more than yeah you know, one or two channels because each channel has to have that one microsecond resolution, it gets difficult because just the time it takes to control one LED, if the other LED needs switching on like very, very close in time, you, you're not going to be able to do that. The other issue is that if you're using higher power LEDs, which are using some sort of switch mode drive, like a constant current driver I see, that will have its own switching frequency. And that will typically be somewhere in the few hundred kilohertz region. So let's say it's 500 kilohertz. If your PWM is has a one microsecond resolution, that's only half a cycle of your um, LED driver IC. And there's two issues here. Some driver ICs will actually synchronize their oscillator so that when, when you turn them off, it actually stops their oscillator. So as you fade up from off to, to on, you'll get gradually like one cycle, then two cycles, then three cycles of its own oscillator, which is not usually a huge problem. It gives you a little bit of steppiness, but where you have a real problem is if you have a driver which isn't synchronized, you've got this 500 kilohertz oscillator in your driver IC, and you're trying to turn that on with one microsecond resolution, at the low end, what basically ends up is you get flicker, because let's say you're turning on for, I know, say three microseconds at a time, it will sometimes do maybe one cycle, sometimes two cycles, sometimes one, depending on the, the relative frequencies of those oscillators. So that the, the symptom is that as you get to lower brightnesses, you'll just start seeing this instability and this flickering in the brightness level. And that can actually be quite difficult to deal with. That is a case where sometimes a combination of PWM and current control can actually be worthwhile there. So at the lower levels, you back off the current, so you're not needing to generate these really short, um, short pulses. But it, it's something that, yeah, in some cases, you, you need, need to be aware of. All right, I was going to swap these two slides over. Now, if your hardware PWM, let's say in your micro, hasn't got enough resolution, there are techniques you can do to actually improve it. You can actually combine two PWM frequencies. It's a bit hard to, I think I'll sit back and forth to the, the diagram. Um, by instead of always turning on for the same time every cycle, you actually vary, you apply a little bit of dither to that. So if you look at the top and the bottom, I've done this as a, uh, a one in five purely to make the percentages work out nicely. So if you look at the top, right, the top that's basically two in five, which gives 40%. The bottom one is um, three out of five, which gives you 60%. But what what by di with, with dithering PWM, we we actually have like a a secondary lower frequency cycle, which in this case is four cycles. So we can say instead of having it say for two every cycle or for three every cycle, we can say we can have it for three for one cycle and two for the other cycles. Or every yeah we go three two three two. So it means that instead of just forty and sixty percent, we can do forty five, fifty, and fifty five percent. Which order is this in? So. Um, yeah, so there are some lead drivers that actually implement this. They call it different names, Enhanced Spectrum PWM, Scramble PWM, Dither PWM. Each manufacturer's got their own name for it. But it's basically the, sim sim um, the same thing. You're combining a low-frequency modulation onto your high-frequency PWM to give you more, um, more resolution. Ideally, you want your, yeah, your pri primary frequency PWM needs to be fast enough that you have the opportunity to do this dithering. So that generally means you want that to be above the audio frequency. Um, the the sub-PWM does give you a very small amount of ripple on your output, but because it's, it's literally it's only one step, it's a very small amount, and you can also make it so that that's always at the highest possible frequency. So if you, if you look back to the, um, the timing diagram, um, for this case of 50%, what we could have done is 2, 2, 3, 3, but if we actually rearrange it so that at all times we use the highest possible frequency. It means that that ripple is also at the highest possible frequency um, and therefore it's less noticeable. In practice, it make, doesn't make a huge difference, but in fact, this is actually really easy to implement if you're doing it in software, which we'll show you in a minute. Um, yeah, so, so you're basically using... Th this is very useful, say, to if you've got, say, a microcontroller, which is quite common, certainly on the PIC range, to only have 12 bits of hardware PWM. Um, th this is a very nice technique just to increase that 
very, you know, very easily. So if we look at some uh, sample figures, where primary frequency 15 kilohertz above audio, the second one 64 cycles, which gives us an extra six bit. So if you've got a 10 bit um, PWM peripheral, we can add another, effectively another six bits to that to give a 16 bit PWM um, very easily. This is just a very simple code example. This is on a PIC, uh, very low end 8 bit PIC. Um, and the way we generate that, that dithering is we just have an, an 8 bit accumulator. Every cycle we add our fraction to it, and that will effectively overflow when that overflows. So, for example, if it's at 50%, um, that will be 80 hex. If you keep adding that to the accumulator, it will overflow on every other operation, which will stretch every other cycle. If it's, say, 40 hex, it will carry every fourth cycle, so it will stretch every fourth PWM cycle. So literally, that is all the code. There is a little hack here that I, I'm using the hardware carry register just because it's hard to detect a carry in C, but literally, that is all the code you need per channel to turn a 10-bit um, PWM to a 16-bit PWM on, on a pick. And you can apply the same techniques on other micros, and of course, you can use the same technique if you're doing an FPGA. It's yeah, just as simple to do an FPGA. So... Um, that's PWM, which is fine. The problem with PWM is as you start needing to flash or you know, control more, more channels, it doesn't scale very well because for each channel, you effectively need some hardware. So PWM is normally impl implemented by a counter and you have a comparator. So at the start of the cycle, it will say, turn the lead off. And when the, count, when the count matches your comparator, it will turn it on. So for each channel, you need that comparator um, either in hardware or as a software um, implementation to turn each lead on at exactly the right time. And that's where it becomes problematic, particularly if you're trying to do it in software. So, for example, if you've got like your little microcontroller, you've made sort of 20 or 30 LEDs and you want nice sort of smooth, you know, throbbing brightness control on those. You can't really do that with PWM because you can't really generate those channels in software because each one needs its own microsecond level precision, which is, yeah, there are ways to do it, but it gets really fiddly really quickly. So there's a better way. Some of you will have known, will have be aware of this. And this is the technique that's used in things like video wall panels. So for each cycle, instead of turning the lead on once and then off, for a certain amount of time, you define a number of time periods. This is an example showing 16 levels. So you have um, a number of periods, each of which is half the previous one. And by then turning the lead on, deciding for each period whether that lead is on or off, you can create whatever brightness you need. So my throat's getting really dry. <laughs> And the key advantage of this is the timing is always the same regardless of the number of channels. These time periods are always the same whether you're driving 10 LEDs or 10,000. The only thing you're changing is deciding whether a LED is on or off at a particular period. So that's a case of you're loading, you're typically, it's quite common to use this using external shift registers. So you're deciding what data to load into those shift registers for each of these four periods. And by Generating that, that, that data correctly, you can generate intensity data for yeah, as many LEDs as you physically got pins to drive. But the, the key thing is that the timing is all the same, and that's where you get this scalability. The timing is the same. All you're doing is generating the data that you need to display, oh, display in all those, those um, slots. And the, the other nice thing is that you've got a very flexible trade-off um, in the you know, number of bits versus frame rate. It's basically how many ti those time periods. So if you want let's say 12-bit resolution, you generate those 12 time periods, each one being twice or half the other one, um, and you can create all those um, different intensities. Again, the same constraints that apply to PWM apply to this in terms of the overall frequency to avoid flicker, um, but it's just a different way of um, approaching the same problem. And the nice thing about this is, particularly if you're doing this on a micro, also if you're doing an FPGA, but on a micro, the only thing that you need to do in hardware is to be able to turn um, on and off for a specific length of time. So, for example, if you're using output uh, shift registers to control your LEDs, most shift registers have an enable pin. So if you can drive that enable pin from a, a timer peripheral, like a compare peripheral, that will give you precise pulse lengths, that's all you need in terms of hardware. Um, yeah, there, there is typically a little bit of dead time between the pulses, but that doesn't actually matter that much. Um, that's, again, if you're doing it in software, that's just your software 
um, doing various things, working out the next set of data, shifting data into those external shift registers. But it doesn't actually make it, as long as your cycle time, each group of those pulses is consistent, you know, you've got accurate timing between those. And as long as the pulses themselves are accurate in terms of their length, where those pulses are and any gaps between them don't actually have any visible effect at all. Um, because you're still turning the lead on for the same amount of time within each cycle. So, that, for example, if you're doing this in software, you've got other interrupts going on in the system, the jitter, that, the timing jitter that, that may happen doesn't actually cause any visible jitter if you do it right, of course. <laughs> um, but the other thing is what you can do is often you're using uh, shift registers that have a local latch, say some, some like a Sim4HC595 or one of umpteen lead drivers. What you can be doing is that you load your data in and you start this pulse, and once this pulse is started, you can be ship it shifting in your next lot of data, and then when this pulse finishes, you then latch it, and then you can start the next pulse really quickly afterwards. So if you're clever, you can actually get very little dead time, which means you can have a yeah, very high percentage maximum lead brightness um, by doing this. Yeah, the code can get quite interesting because sometimes the range of these pulses, if you get up to, say, 12 bits, you've got a 4,000 to 1 relationship between the longest pulse and the shortest pulse. And as you get to the shorter pulses, the pulse ends up shorter than the um, time it takes to shift the data into the shift register. So um, it, it gets a little bit fiddly, but it, it's all fairly doable. Once you understand the basic, prin basic principle, um, it can be a very useful technique, say, for driving... A, a moderate to large number of LEDs, particularly from a microcontroller, and say once you get onto things like the video panels, it's, it's literally the only way that you can do it. Um, you just can't really do it with PWM. Um, sorry, take a pause. And say so almost all LED drivers and even things like the HC595s have this enable pin for this specific purpose. And so there's various ways you can generate the micro, the pulses on a micro. Most timer peripherals can produce accurate pulse lengths. Um, you can do it with timer interrupt if you're really careful. Um, but I, I've actually done it sometimes with a spare UART. Because also, a UART with certain data patterns, you can actually produce low going pulses of certain length. It's not ideal, but you can do it. And I, I have done it <laughs> on one occasion. Um, so it's, it's often, generally, if you're driving a lot of LEDs, you need you, know, you don't have enough pins, so you need to use external registers of some sort. You might want to use external constant current drivers if you care about even um, appearances. Um, but so you can actually use this on directly on microcontroller pins. I did one project that had, I can't remember, it was something like 12 RGB LEDs driven directly. No, it must have been maybe 10 RGB LEDs driven directly from PIC I.O. pins. And the only thing you need to be careful there is you know, getting that precise on-off time, which generally when you write a microcontroller port, you can like, write eight, eight um, lines at once. Or you can also use the, um, the tri-state pin sometimes to provide that enable-disable time. Um, you can also use it with other te techniques, for example, multiplex and Charlie Pex displays. You can use this technique. Um, obviously, it starts getting more complicated, but it means you can produce you know, nice dimming on pretty much as many LEDs as you have pins for. And if you have got enough pins, you just stack as many shift registers as you like. Um, in terms of actually implementing this and generating this data that you send to these shift registers, um, typically, if you're outputting data, let's say at, at say 250 hertz, your LEDs are often not actually always changing on every frame. So if that's the case, instead of gen calculating all your shift register data every time, you can pre-calculate it all, stick it in a buffer, and then a very simple interrupt task, all it does is it takes the data, you, you've got some um, hardware generating these pulses, generating an interrupt at the end of each pulse, and then that interrupt just causes it to shift this data out of the buffer. You could even use DMA if you, um, in some cases. And in terms of how you actually generate this data, it's... It's actually quite simple, but it can actually end up quite fiddly, particularly if you're doing it in a high-level language that doesn't really have very good support for bit operations, like C, for example. So here, here's the example, again, of having four, uh, four bits, just for simplicity. So these are our four channel values in binary. And what you're effectively doing is sending all the high, bit, high bits 
for the first this first cycle, then all the next bits down for this cycle. So what you're effectively doing, if you dry out all your values in binary, you're effectively just rotating at 90 degrees and say this this is this looks messy to do in C. I tend to do it with macros and great big unrolled loops because I've usually got enough code space to do it and I care about how long it takes. But you could do it iteratively. And it's one of those things that's probably almost easier to do in assembly than in C. But um, once you get the hang of actually what's going on, um, it, yeah, it, it is fa fairly straightforward. What am I doing on time? Okay, so um, next subject. Quite often I've had from customer. Okay, I, I want to do this really, really massive like line of three meter line of LEDs, and I want them to be really, really, really bright. They want to be like one watt LEDs, and I want to control every pixel. Um, yeah. <laughs> I did, I did actually say that to a client once. <laughs> so, you know, generating large numbers of lower power LEDs is generally pretty easy. There's lots of multi-channel LED drivers out there um, from loads of different manufacturers. So, um, but once you start getting towards the sort of above about 50 milliamps per LED, that's when things start getting messy, complicated, expensive. The actual lead drivers themselves, they tend to use linear constant current circuits and above 100 milliamps, you start running into thermal problems. Um, and the whole thing just suddenly becomes a lot more complicated. Um, you tend to start needing to look at, say, a switch mode regulator, which then brings on those problems with the, the granularity of its oscillator, cost, size, etc. Um, and obviously, because if you're doing this, yeah, lots of these bright LEDs, that's going to need a lot of power. So you want to be distributing power at probably 12, 24 volts to keep the current sensible. So you don't have massive great wires and you don't have issue with uh, voltage drop. Um, so, you know, once you start thinking about high power, you start thinking about these sort of things where you've got all the, all the light in a really small space, which means that you quite often need to use a metal clad PCB to get the heat out because it's in such a concentra concentrated space. They're low voltage, high current, so you have all the issues of voltage drop, needing to use, uh, say, a switch mode buck converter or something to drive them. Um, and, yeah, the, the, you, you know, basically you, you've got a massive increase in cost and complexity. But... If you, although you want brightness, you may not necessarily want it in a small concentrated space. So instead of using yeah, one massive LED, why not use groups of small ones? And this is actually a really useful technique, which I've, yeah, I've used all the time, where you'd have, say, a pixel, say, for example, a 24-volt supply, you'd have typically six or seven LEDs in series, and that's your one pixel. So um, there's a few examples here. Um, there's, I think, two groups of six there on that one for 24 volts. This is the one for the Heathrow Airport installation where you've got six LEDs in series for, per pixel. Um, some RGBWs here where, again, you've got strings of six RGBWs in series. Um, this is like a double-sided board where there's like two, two, two on each side to provide eight LEDs, which I think ran from 36-ish volts in series. And this is an, uh, an RGBW with a like, separate RGB and white LEDs. Again, two groups of six running on a 24-volt supply. And yeah, there's a lot of benefits on, on this. Firstly, your heat is distributor, distributed over a wider area. So typically, you, know, you can use a standard fiberglass board instead of needing a metal clad board. Um, you're still dealing with low lead currents. You're still dealing with, say, 20 or 30 milliamps per lead. So you're, you, know, you can still use much simpler circuitry. You could use very simple, like a resistive dropper if you've got if you know your supply is nice and stable, 24 volts, you can just use some series resistors to, um, as your, to set your current. Or you could use the multi-channel LED driver chips um, from the higher supply, but because your current is still fairly low, they'll still work fine. They're running you know, six times as much LED, but the current's the same. So the LED driver is yeah, quite happy. Um, your light source is more diffuse. Um, which may be a good thing, for example, if you want to avoid casting hard shadows. Um, also, you can pack, pack them tighter together, but at some point you're going to run into thermal um, issues. And also, you could shape it. You can. Uh, that someone's LED's got a little bit too hot, I think. Um, <laughs> you can yeah, make the LEDs in a particular shape if you want to generate a shape light source as well. And also, particularly with white, small white LEDs designed for the lighting market are really, really cheap. Even good brand name ones, Osram, I, the Osram Duro C3 is my favourite. I've not counted, but I think I've probably designed in somewhere around a million of those in, in the, over the years. But they're, you know, they're a good brand name and they're very cheap. And if you, you, know, if, if you want to go for cheaper, AliExpress, they're well under half a cent if you buy in full real quantities, light, yeah, lighting grade um, white LEDs. 
There are some other solutions, uh, which I've used a couple of times. Um, you can actually get white lighting LEDs with a number of dye in the same package. This one at the top I particularly like. This is a 3x3 three three millimeter package, which you can get for either 24 or 48 volt operation. It's got either 6 or uh, 12 dyes in the same package. Um, there's a few others, like these uh, Accrish, which I think these are three, uh, I think it's a six die, but if you look through DigiKey and filter by forward voltage, like over three volts, you'll see there's a number of these. So, um, but the nice thing about these is because they're designed for low current, high voltage, they're a lot easier to drive. So you can take a standard, this is uh, the Texas 5971, which is a 12 channel driver. Now, although the output is only rated at 17 volts, because you are, each of those LEDs drops, drops three volts, although you're feeding them from 24 volts, the LED driver output will never see that anything like its maximum voltage. So you can just use that driver to drive these great big long strings to produce massive amounts of brightness, which is the standard little um, driver I see. Um, this has also got an internal regulator, which I think goes up to about 16 volts. So again, all you need to do is just stick a Zener diode in there just to drop the, that voltage. They only take a, a few milliamps, so a simple Zener dropper. So that is a, a cascadable driver, which will produce yeah, a lot of brightness. Um, very simple. I've got a, a, a quick demo of this. Here. So, so that'll do this sort of brightness. <laughs> Very, very simply. And the, the nice thing, one nice thing is because these are a small, small source, you can actually produce some quite nice shadow effects. You, should, you, know, you actually sort of cast interesting shadows um, and do some quite nice effects. But this is actually on a metal PCB. It's pro yeah, if, you run these, yeah, if you run these continuously, then you'd need the, the metal PCB. But uh, as I say, you can get a very nice, super bright thing with, yeah, it's literally just a bunch of drivers all strung together so that the hardware is extremely simple and cheap. And um, yeah, I've done, done one of those that's about five meters long, which works fine. Okay, how am I doing on time? Yeah, I may not. So there's a, there's a couple of uh, additional things I'll put in at the end of here. Um, I'll probably be going a bit, a bit quick, so I'm worried about my throat drying off. So a lot of people ask me, what's my favorite lead driver? Um, probably this one. This is the Texas 5971. It's a cascadable serial driver. It's, it's, it's very similar in terms of uh, drive to the APA 102 type uh, LEDs where you've got a clock and data going in and then it buffers to you basically um, cascade this to as many drivers as you like. A um, couple of package options, QFN if you're doing really small stuff, TSSOP for um, bigger things. These uh, that's using the uh, TSSOP one, which is there. Um, up to 60 milliamps per channel over 12 channels. 12 channels, a lot of lead drivers are 16 channel, but um, if you're doing RGB, that's a bit of a pain. You either have to have channel spanning uh, drivers or you have separate drivers for RG and B. The nice thing about 12 is that it's good for RGB and RGBW. Um, so 60 milliamps per channel, you can actually parallel up the channel. So if you want 120 milliamps, you can actually do that by using two channels in parallel. It's 16 bit dither PWM plus another seven bits to set the current as well. So you've got global, yeah, a nice wide range of global brightness as well as without losing any of your 16 bits of um, intensity. The, uh, so the interface is a simple clock and data interface. You can cascade them. I think I've done about 100 where, to, to test and it, that, that just works works fine. Um, very flexible on power supply. You can run them off a single five volt supply, but if you're using, say, high voltages, they have, have an internal regulator. You can use a Zener if necessary to, to drop the voltage down to what it needs. So again, this this board here, it's literally just, th these big black things are connectors, so ignore those. It's literally the driver, Zener, a couple of capacitors for each 12 LEDs, and you can literally extend that as long as you like there. They're not as cheap as, I, as I'd like, but most of these projects, the actual cost of the leads of components are a fairly small portion, proportion of the over, overall cost. The other nice thing is that um, any constant current driver has a dropout voltage, so that it needs a certain amount of voltage across the output in order to maintain constant current, and these are actually quite good. At low currents, it's down to about 0.2 a volt, and that means that you can use a lithium-ion battery, if, obviously I'm talking about handheld portable wearable type stuff, you can drive RGBW LEDs from a lithium-ion battery directly without any voltage boosters and maintain constant current, which is very nice if you're doing some really sort of flashy... Um, wearable type stuff. 
Um, my other favourite lead driver is basically an 8-bin pick, um, which has got four 10-bit PWMs. And again, you can increase that to 16 bits um, with, say, for example, driving a string of leads using some uh, small external MOSFETs. Um, it hasn't got a UART, but generally you're dealing with like tens of K bits, although you can actually, I've, I've done these up to about 300 K bits with a bit bashed UART just. Um, and of course you can completely customize the protocol because it's whatever you decide to code. We could actually make them do DMX directly and do things like measure local temperatures and do limiting based on, um, on temperature. Um, something a lot of people ask me is why don't I use the various WS28, 12, you know, pixels, whatever. The thing is, most of the installations I do are you know, designed for permanent. They need to last years. And you know, those devices are basically designed for toy-type applications. There's numerous horror stories of them dying at, you know, after reflow. The other problem is you've only got 8-bit per pixel control, so you effectively have no control over global brightness. Um, the APA 102s, the SPI type ones, do have some global brightness. I think they've got five bits of global brightness, but that reduces the, they do that by effectively chopping them at a fairly low PWM frequency. And again, you have these, you know, question, questionable quality issues. Um, so I've, you know, I've yet to have a project where I'd feel comfortable using those. If it was maybe a temporary exhibition, maybe. What I would love is, is if, say, Texas Instruments and Osram got together to make a good quality lead with a good quality driver built in. Now, Osram have actually produced something which I've not yet looked at in detail, which actually is designed more for lighting applications. They actually integrate a lead and a driver with a rather weird protocol, but they actually calibrate them at the factory so that the driver actually has calibration for the actual lead die it's produced for doing like very accurate color rendering but so i've i don't actually know if that's available i saw it at electronica last year and the guy was a little bit vague as to how available it was going to be um but uh, that that looks potentially interesting but say quite a lot of projects i've done recently have been literally nothing but making boards with an rgb led and a white led and a tlc 5971 on the back and i'd really rather not do that but it's really the only the way yeah the way the only way we've been able to do stuff um with and know that it's going to be reliable because we're using brand name LEDs, a LED driver that from a manufacturer we've actually heard of with a data sheet that you can read in English. Um, and yeah, it works, but it'll be nice to be able to do it more simply. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>